So just there's some microphones in the middle if you have questions. Otherwise, I'll grill these people. <laughs> so Dan, Dan. We're going to defer to you. But Bob, Bob. <laughs> You're not allowed to do that. Bob, can I make a comment about the um, adjuvant trials? Of course. Um, so one thing Dr. Sher was mentioning is all these adjuvant trials that are out there, and they're all compared to placebos. And patients are randomized potentially to a placebo-containing treatment. And when we talk about these in front of patients, it, it's, it's a challenge uh, uh, oftentimes to tell patients you could be on a trial and be assigned to a placebo, which is no treatment. And to, to make patients understand that that's an ethical treatment, that the standard treatment for, for early stage high risk disease is really no treatment but, but close observation. And patients are oftentimes uncomfortable thinking they could be assigned to a placebo treatment, uh, and, and part of, it, of our job is to make them understand that that's actually a, 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 the standard of care. Thank you, David. So, so Dan, let me ask you, um, just to set people's minds at ease, how often when you see a pathology specimen from an outside institution that you're doing a secondary review of, um, are, are they different enough that it might change therapy or change the conclusions? Um, well, you know, we probably see maybe five or six secondary reviews a week. Um, and I would say maybe one or two of those, we do have a slight difference of opinion, which would be um, a staging issue Perhaps we would identify intravascular invasion or invasion into a renal vein or into the renal sinus, which would upstage from a T1 to a T3, essentially. So, yeah, so maybe 20% of the time we do see significant changes. Also, classification, sub subtype classification is, is actually pretty common as well. Um, there's a tendency, because of the commonality of clear cell RCCs, and again, I. It's just, you know, the nature of the business. Um, a lot of uh, pathology that's diagnosed outside of major academic institutions is done through either commercial labs or small private uh, pathology laboratories where they might see a renal cell carcinoma maybe once a month. Right. Whereas we see on a daily basis, we see two, three, four potentially a day. It's our bread and butter. It's We're really good at it, as are UCLA and USC. I mean. You want uh, somebody at a, your, your pathology reviewed at a big institution where they're very comfortable doing it. And so it's, it's very easy for someone at, who only sees one a month to say, well, I think it probably is clear cell because that's the most common subtype. I'm just going to sort of sign it out as such and send it along. And it might be something different. Hyung, um, let's talk a little bit more about surgical approaches. In your practice, how often do you use the robot? How often laparoscopically? And, and talk a little bit about um, hospital stays, loss of, of blood during a, a procedure, and, and kind of the, uh, what the patients feel as a result of your interventions. Yeah, so uh, those are all questions that, uh, uh, you know, that are on the very forefront of patients' minds. Uh, if you do an open operation, you're in the hospital typically for a week. Um, if you do laparoscopic surgery, you get out in one or two days. Uh, and so there is a big difference. People who uh, are having curative surgery are looking to get back to work quickly. And so, uh, you know, we do laparoscopy when we can. Um, the only time we have to actually make a big incision is if you have tumor growing into the major vessels of the body like the vena cava, which leads right to the heart. So for when, we, when you have to open up uh, blood vessels and major vessels, uh, we do that through a larger incision. Um, otherwise, we can almost always do it using a minimally invasive approach, whether we're taking the whole kidney or not. And that leads to also a decrease in blood loss. Um, and um, the robot um, is used by uh, physicians who uh, have not been formally trained in laparoscopy. Uh, it allows them to do laparoscopic surgery. Um, uh, you know, we, we, we um, in our hands, the robot um, does not add uh, to the operation. It doesn't make it less invasive, doesn't allow us to do 
something we can't normally do with the laparoscope. So um, we don't usually use it. Um, uh, uh, so there, there's not, the only time we, we might use it is, um, you know, if the only room we, we can get to do a case is the room with the robot. So, <laughs> so it's sometimes it's a more of a scheduling issue than a tech, you know, than, uh, than, than anything else. Uh, but, uh, but I guess if you look at the whole field of urology, the robot has allowed um, uh, many more so, uh, uh, urologists uh, to do minimally invasive surgery and even partial nephrectomies uh, where, um, uh, 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 because, they, uh, because they didn't have the laparoscopic training uh, in, the, in the past. So uh, it's, it's been an important advance um, but um, I think you'll find, uh, you know, what, I, uh, what I'm saying to be the true at, at a, lot of, a lot of major um, uh, academic centers. So Steve, um, and please, anybody, just if you have a question, just step up to the microphone. So, so Steve, one of the, I want you to put on your, your visionary hat and where, where the intersection between radiation oncology and immune-based therapies are going to kind of exists, not just in kidney cancer, but in, in cancer in general, and kind of elaborate a little bit upon some of the work that you do, which really starts to raise the question of whether giving more radiation is in the best interest of the patient's immunologic response versus giving a little bit less to control, but also stimulate an immunologic reaction. Right. Um, so I think that there's been a sea change in the way um, I think the biology of radiation, which is not necessarily, which is kind of just in the early stages of being translated to kind of clinical care, but we think that um, radiation, um, because of its, um, you know, it's one of the few cancer treatments that's actually evolved with, you know, from single cellular organisms. So if you think about it, you know, it's not as if a lot of these targeted agents, you know, were affected, you know, throughout the history of evolution, but radiation has always been there. Um, to some extent. And so what we find is that um, there are unique mechanisms for, um, for removing things that have been irradiated. And many of those mechanisms involve um, things that I study in the lab, which are immune things. So recognition from the immune system that a cell, for instance, has been irradiated and is damaged. And there are also a lot of control mechanisms for that because it's a very complicated process. So you don't want to have inflammation anytime your body encounters even small radiation, which happens, which permeates the environment all the time. And so it's a complicated um, way that your body removes it in a way that's non-inflammatory. And so one of the things that we've tried to do, and I think where radiation will be going, is to try and understand the mechanisms that regulate the, the control of inflammation. Because in the setting of tumors, we want to develop more anti-tumor immune responses. And so how we plan to do that is we want to try and understand how the body itself regulates it. And through some of these newer agents, so um, there are agents that target something called PDL1 that um, Dr. Sher mentioned. Um, there are also um, trials looking at um, high-dose IL-2 in combination with radiation. And these radiation strategies are very different. So it used to be that we use radiation, um, as Dr. Figlin mentioned, to really try and, you know, kind of clean up an area. Like you treat this wide area, you're trying to get rid of, you know, conceptually every last cell. But when you think of radiation as an immune stimulant, it's completely different where we would treat, you know, either a portion of a tumor if, we, if it's not safe to treat the entire thing or you would treat, you know, smaller, uh, you know, certain tumors but not other ones. And, in the, and the hope is to really do it in combination with an immune therapy as uh, a different way of thinking about it, that radiation is more like a targeting agent to give you an in situ vaccine, essentially. So we know we're treating the tumor and we're radiating it and then it allows kind of new tumor, tumor antigens to be released so that your body can recognize the tumor again. And then in combination with immunotherapy, we think that that's um, a way in kidney cancer, but also in maybe many other cancers in which radiation will have an evolving and changing role because it's one of the few, it's, a, it's uniquely mechanistically driven by, um, we think, the immune-mediated systems. And so some of the things I study in lab are we look at macrophages or certain cell types like T cells, and we ask, you know, what are the T cells that are there? What are the macrophages that are there, which are certain types of white blood cells? And how do we affect their, their function? by targeting immune pathways. So things that traditionally, you know, would have been used for 
you know, for instance, autoimmune disease or asthma or kind of any, any of those different things we think can actually affect the immune system in general. And we think that using radiation in combination with some of those things will probably be um, a way that the future evolves um, quickly and differently than it kind of has in the past. Time for lunch. Thanks, everybody. <laughs> we'll reconvene at noon. <laughs>